Film impact transitions are the best transitions for a Premiere Pro. And as of this video's publication, Film Impact is now natively integrated with Premiere in versions 25.5 and higher, which becomes available on September 12th. You won't even need to install them, they just come with Premiere now. And there's no corresponding price increase, effectively making these transitions free for everyone who's already paying for Premiere Pro. Hey, did they watch my video? The tree thing? I did the tree thing. I had this whole spreadsheet price comparison thing, which is no longer relevant, and neither is my affiliate link for Film Impact. So if you don't have Premiere Pro, you can use my new Adobe affiliate link instead. The Film Impact branding will be slowly phased out, but Yap is still in charge of development of these transitions, and his team is still working on cool stuff like the VHS effect. Film impact transitions are the best transitions for Premiere in terms of looks, stability, customizability, and definitely price because now they're free, and I've been using them for over eight years. There's actually a lot of stuff that's in here because I asked for it. They used to come in three different packs, but it looks like you get all of it in Premiere 25.5. Now, I could go through all the unique bad transitions that Film Impact has, which I've never used, like copy machine, frame impacts, what is this for? Chaos, which is just chaos. Maybe it's a horror thing. Panel wipe is just weird, as is slice. Although I did actually use that in one video to slice up sheets of mother glass, but I already told you in the full tutorial linked below not to use ridiculous transitions, and hopefully you're beginning to develop a taste for what's good and bad. Try kaleidoscope, M dash. Trust us. Don't. I've also already explained Film Impact's wipe, dissolve, push, and other really useful workhorse transitions in those transitions own chapters, linked below. So let's talk about some of the remaining good transitions that seem to be unique to Film Impact. The plateau wipe is a cool combination of a zoom and a soft edge wipe. I've used it a lot. I really like it. The fact that you can change the angle also makes it a bit more resistant to transition fatigue. I love the TV power transition. It has a very specific use case, simulating the turning off of a CRT, cathode ray tube, television or monitor. That's it. You can also use it to simulate a screen turning on, but I think this is technically incorrect. In all the reference material I found, CRTs just fade in. But whatever, I've still used it for that. Motion camera. Holy sh**, it's incredible. It feels like driving a spaceship. Let me just show you what this does. Now, in my first Eclipse Trip video, I've got these two maps. One of them of America, and the next one is Missouri. I want to zoom in from here to here. This could be done in After Effects, but it's actually faster and easier to use the motion camera. So let's put that down on there and watch it back, and it's terrible. It's just doing some kind of demo. So we can reset it using reset to zero here or here, or we can go up here to reset to fade. So now you go somewhere on the timeline where you can see both clips at the same time, and now we align them. So we know we've got to do a zoom in. We are using the continuous motion controls, not the temporal controls. I'll show you those ones later. About to there, and then don't use the move parameter. It's the anchor parameter you want to anchor these together. Now, this is getting hard to see. It's all blurry. We've got some repetitions here. So I'm just going to go down here and turn off the mirrors and also the motion blur. And now that's a lot easier to see. Now we do the fine alignment using rotation, zoom, and anchor point. You can hold down control to go just a teensy bit, by the way. There we go. That's it. And as you can see, it's given us the animated zoom in to Missouri. We can also put the motion blur back to make it more aesthetically pleasing. We can use not a wipe. I think we can use just a dissolve. And you can do other interesting stuff. Now let's take a look at the temporal motion controls. What I can do is, well, I mean, let's just see what that does. Woo! So it, it kind of adds it in the middle and then it has to undo it, right? This is why I don't use these. We can add some tilt though, and that is kind of fun. And if I add some to the move parameter, it'll look like we're racing up to it. See what I said about why this feels like driving a spaceship? 
So that's one possibility, right? No matter what happens inside the transition, it will always start here and it will always end here. The transition deals with everything in between. And keep in mind, you can do this for anything, like I could do it for Texas as well, right? Yeah, you can zoom to and from anywhere. So I used this again a few times in this same video. I used it here, whoop, 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 and it does the animation for me. I can extend it if I want to, right? And it'll just, it'll just do it. The star also needs its own little transition. Then I used it again to go from this map to this map. So if we use the move controls instead of the anchor controls for something like Texas, like it's way down here, right? And like they're both moving way up there to get up there, shoo, right? You see, like it's, it's just weird. I don't know what it's for. I don't know how it works. So I just use anchor point for the kind of motion that I want to do. Here, I used it to do this thing that I did with the background. I don't know why, but I kind of like it. Here, I used it for a rather lame spinning dissolve. I guess I was just experimenting. And again, here, I used it to zoom out from microcode to a CPU die, and then again to a platter. I believe I used the transform effect for that skew. And the slow zooming out that happens between the transitions is just normal keyframing of the scale parameter. I absolutely love this transition. I don't use it a lot, but when I do, it saves so much time versus doing this stuff manually in After Effects. Next up, the motion tween. This one blew my mind when I first saw it. It's definitely intended for objects smaller than the frame, not full frame transitions. Check it out. We've got an object over here. Let's make a cut on the timeline. Now move it, rescale it, and rotate it. Watching that back, it just teleports from one spot to the other. But guess what? Plunk down the motion tween transition on that cut, and kablammo, it animates itself. No keyframing. Look, I'll move it somewhere else, change another parameter, make the transition last longer, and it just deals with it all for you. And you can fiddle with all these parameters to make the motion more interesting. I can add a spin, again, without having to keyframe it. I used the motion tween to move all my campsite items into my car. I used it to move this little star along with the map that was already being moved with the motion camera transition. And I've used it in countless tech quickie videos, but we'll never know which ones because it's just motion. There is one big caveat, which is, again, transitions don't know anything about what's going on beyond the edges of the frame. So if your object extends beyond those frame edges, that image data will go missing. However, there is a partial solution. Just go down here and select Blend Type Composite. Now it'll use data from both clip A and clip B. This is actually the default now. So if one of them has the picture data, they'll both get to use it. Fantastic. It still doesn't work if neither clip A or B have that data. So in that case, you're better off doing manual keyframing as usual. But there is something I'd like to change about this one. This motion curve affects everything. So if you add rotation and you have overshoot or bounce, it comes along for the ride and then undoes itself in a way that would never happen unless everything is on rails. Basically, every single motion parameter is affected by this curve, and they really shouldn't be. Rotation, for example, almost always looks weird to me when it overshoots and comes back. So it would be nice to be able to uncouple specific parameters from the anticipation and overshoot curves. But I can see that becoming a nightmare of checkboxes, so I'm not sure what a good solution would be for that, at least from a user interface perspective. Actually, it looks okay to me, but it was my idea. Next up, text animator. Holy sh**, it's so good, you guys have no idea. Where before I had to round trip through After Effects to do cool stuff, now I have a bunch of cool stuff I can do right inside of the text animator transition. Make no mistake, After Effects can do significantly more, but Text Animator can do it faster, especially if you have some of your own presets. Again, utilizing Film Impact's amazing control over transparency, this transition auto-detects where it thinks your words and characters are, and can then animate them in numerous different ways. That does mean it only works on text above a transparent background. This is another transition that I haven't used nearly enough 
enough, so I don't have much to say about it, but I can tell it has huge potential. The biggest thing missing, I'd say, would be some really solid, nice-looking, general-use presets. The presets they have right now honestly suck. Except for the fade, that one's good, because it's simple. Remember, simple is often better. I don't want this transition to show off, shooting random characters all over the place. Most of the time, I want elegance, dignity, restraint, which these presets are not. I would throw them all out and start over, referencing some really nice text animation from expert kinematic typographers. And if the transition can't do those things, redesign it until it can. Here's an idea. Expand the functionality of this global crop feature and allow it to function per letter, word, or line. Now you can do cool effects like this which would otherwise require you to manually split up your text box into multiple boxes and rearrange the crop for each one, which is exactly the kind of finicky work that we're trying to avoid by using this transition instead. Don't be surprised if this and other transitions improve in the future now that I've made this tutorial. Again, Film Impact is very open to constructive criticism and improving their offerings. In fact, they already have. I sent them a bunch of bug reports and feature suggestions while making this tutorial, and Film Impact has already implemented several of them. Let's move on to the shape flow, and holy sh**, it's another ringer. This is so cool, I didn't even believe it was real at first. I thought it was just some fake, only works in the demo bullsh**, until I tried it myself. Yep, turns out Film Impact's control over transparency is so good that they can do stuff like this. Basically, it's a super fancy wipe that will grow along the opaque areas of an image. You can even add multiple colors that come along for the ride. Here, I made this tree grow from a weird spot and then burn away from another. You can even grow from more than one point with a variable delayed start. I really wish I knew about this one sooner. I surely would have used it a lot. If you're ever confused about how exactly to use a Film Impact transition, by the way, you can click the Tutorial Available button at the bottom. Speaking of which, let's do that and watch this video, How to Animate Your Logo. As much as I like Film Impact, I've got to give them fair criticism. This is a dumb way to animate a logo. And it's a dumb way to use Film Impact's transitions. Doing this kind of work with After Effects instead is way faster and easier and non-destructive and makes it easier to make global changes later. Assuming you have it and know how to use it in this way, which, uh, I do not. Just keep that in mind. If you find yourself using dozens of transitions across multiple nested sequences, it's probably easier to use After Effects. However, layering just a few transitions on top of each other can achieve some fantastic results with little to no keyframing, specifically with the Film Impact transitions intended for smaller objects, not the full frame. And it's so easy to do because your timeline probably already has different objects on different layers. Just plop a few Film Impact transitions on the ends and see what you can make. I have to talk about this. Did you know there's different skews for plain Oreos? I swear, these ones don't taste as good. It's these ones that you want. Oh, they look the same. It says the same. No, the ingredients are different. Look at the, you want this one, not that one. Yeah, it's some BS. Now my teleprompter is showing me a lamp ad, but it's, <laughs> it's mirrored. So on the tier list, I am giving Film Impact an A. Nobody gets S tier. All things considered, Film Impact has the best transitions, which is why I've been using and recommending them for eight years. Now, there are still a few more things to cover before we finish up here. First of all, I've been saying this entire time that transitions should be thematically appropriate. That is, they should be in some way related to or simulating the real thing that is being shown. But I should mention that this is not an absolute rule. It's more like a guideline. Sometimes it can look way better or more interesting to use the wrong transition. So don't be afraid to experiment. Writing this video was agonizing. It's very difficult to nail down any solid rules for transitions because it all depends on lots of other stuff. And maybe you disagree with some of the things I've said. 
That's fine. Leave a comment with your rationale as to why the paint splatter transition is actually amazing. I don't know. Actually, I'm gonna prove myself wrong right now. Yep, that's pretty awesome. So this specific stock transition in Premiere is still garbage. I still stand by that opinion. But with enough knowledge and effort, you can make an awesome looking version of anything. And they did. Realistically, you can't spend this much effort on every single transition, unless you've got some serious money and man hours to burn. Realistically, it's the transitions that are simpler and easier and faster to use which become the main workhorses for your video editing. At least that's what's been working for me. Second of all, the secondary keyboard that allows me to apply presets with a single keystroke. If you've never seen this before, hi, you must be new here, I've also been using this thing for eight years, and I've already made lots of video tutorials on how to make one yourself. I still use and recommend the Hasu USB converter to make it work. But if you don't think you can afford that, I'd recommend Lua Macros. Interception can really screw with your keyboard drivers if you're not careful. It's all detailed in this playlist. You're gonna have to learn to script in AutoHotKey, but all the code is free from my GitHub repository. Do not use ChatGPT or any other AI thing to figure it out for you. You will fail and I will not feel sorry for you. Third of all, the advice from this video in particular is half right and half wrong. Yes, editors shouldn't use a ton of crazy transitions. Yes, the timing of cuts is more important than the transitions you use. But I strongly disagree with this advice. The only transitions I think you should ever use in video editing are your cross dissolve or cross fade, or a dip to black or a dip to white. Because you'll never learn how to properly use transitions if you're too afraid to misuse them first. You need to experiment, get messy, take chances and make mistakes, or you'll never learn. You'll never grow as an artist. You'll never figure out all the cool stuff that you can do if you let the fear of failure control you. Also, you don't have to publish all your experiments and potential failures for the whole internet to see. I don't. Remember, the secret ingredients to good video editing, and many other things, is enthusiasm. I'll see you next time.